Well, the time has come to enter the more classic part of the Star Wars Expanded Universe with the start of a new saga. This time, we're taking a look at the Thrawn Trilogy. As mentioned last time, with the end of the Star Wars Trilogy, as far as Lucasfilm and 20th Century Fox were concerned, Star Wars, as a series, was done with. It wasn't until the mid-90s when serious steps were made to continue telling stories with the characters of the original films. Ultimately, Bantam Books worked with Lucasfilm and 20th Century Fox to get the rights to publish new Star Wars books under their Bantam Spectra label, which is what they use for science fiction. To launch the new series, Bantam approached Timothy Zahn, who had previously won a Hugo Award for the novella Cascade Point. Zahn accepted and got sent as reference material a several boxes of source books for the West End game Star Wars RPG. I have no idea if he still has them. The Thrawn Trilogy is made up of three books. Heir to the Empire, Dark Force Rising, and The Last Command. I'm going to be covering the plots of the whole trilogy in one whack. With some summarization. It is five years after the Battle of Endor. The Rebel Alliance has captured the Imperial capital of Coruscant and is working to build a legitimate government in the form of the New Republic. Spearheading the efforts of the New Republic Council is Leia Organa Solo, who is also pregnant with twins. However, these efforts have two monkey wench wrenches thrown in the works. The first is efforts by Bothan Councilor Borsk Felia, who is trying to play politics by Bothan rules, which is focused more on accruing personal power, and that's not entirely helpful when you're trying to build a legitimate government. But the greater issue is Thrawn, the last of the Imperial Grand Admirals and the only non-human among their number. At some point, he returned from the outer reaches of the galaxy and has shaped the Imperial Remnant from a bunch of infighting warlords into a powerful fighting force, one that has the capability to retake the galaxy. Thrawn's plan is threefold. The first part involves the unstable clone of Jedi Master Joris Sabayoth, known as Jorus Sabayoth, who was serving as the guardian of the Emperor's storehouse on the planet Wayland. Using Sabayoth's knowledge of the Force and Jedi battle meditation, Thrawn will coordinate a series of simultaneous strikes through multiple systems to throw the Republic military into a state of disorganization. In return, Thrawn is promised Sabayoth will retrieve Leia and her twins to raise and shape as he sees fit. These attacks will force the Republic to throw a lot of their warships into convoy duty, either as escorts or to be converted as the freight haulers themselves in order to help rebuild after the Empire strikes. This will lead to them being routed through some common stripyards, particularly the ones in Dolbringi. At this point, Thrawn will attack the shipyards, not to crush the Republic fleet, but to steal it. At which point, Using this advanced shipping power, the, the increased size of his fleet, Thrawn will use two of the devices from the storehouse to seal their public's fate. First, he will use the cloning technology from the Emperor's storehouse to create an army of clones to crew the ships that Thrawn has captured, 
along with providing ground troops to occupy the worlds that they capture. Finally, to cut the Republic government off from the rest of the galaxy, Thrawn will put a bunch of cloaking devices on some asteroids and drop them in orbit around Coruscant, effectively putting the planet under siege. No ship can make it out the surface without risking getting clobbered, and no ship could make it down for the same reasons. Additionally, in order for a ship to arrive or depart, the government would have to lower the planetary defense field, which would risk asteroids hitting the planet's surface, causing massive amounts of damage. As Thrawn begins to put this plan into motion, our heroes try, over these three books, to get to the bottom of these plans and thwart them, and in the course of their efforts, they end up running into a few new allies. The first is Talon Card, a smuggler chieftain who moved into the power vacuum created by the death of Jabba the Hutt. However, while Jabba was a murderous despot, Card tries to be a more benevolent feature, figure. As far as he's concerned, he's a businessman providing a service. A service being delivering goods to people in worlds where the government would rather those goods not be delivered. Card gets drug into this when Thrawn comes to the planet Merkur, where Card has his base, in order, in order to obtain Islamari, an alien life form that has the ability to create a bubble where the Force effectively doesn't exist, and several Islamari together can reinforce their bubbles to create a larger one. Thrawn wants them as an insurance policy against Sabaoth, and to help with his cloning efforts. This puts Card on Thrawn's radar, especially when Thrawn goes hunting for Luke Skywalker to give him to Sabaoth as well. When Luke escapes from Thrawn's clutches, he Thrawn sends a call out to, to all the smugglers they have dealings with to get to Skywalker, and much... To Card's ill luck, Luke ends up falling into his lap. Our hero's next ally, a more reluctant one, is Mara Jade. When we meet Mara, she is one of Card's lieutenants, and one who Card is planning to make his number two. I'll get more into her in the characters section. The third is General Garmabel Iblis, a Karelian general who used to be part of the Rebel Alliance, but who faked his death and split with the Alliance after a disagreement with Mon Mothma. He brings with him, in addition to a force of warships, information on a long-lost fleet of older public dreadnoughts known as the Katana Fleet, or more colloquially, the Dark Force. However, our heroes have to get to it before Thrawn does. Finally, there are the Nogri. They are an alien race who Thrawn has been using as his assassins and enforcers, and who previously had been the allies of Darth Vader, and they, in turn, looked on Vader with religious reverence and awe. When a Nogri commando team is sent to kidnap Leia, one of the members of the team discovers that Leia is Darth Vader's daughter. In an attempt to stop the kidnapping attempts, and ideally to get these people out from under the Empire's thumb, she and Chewbacca travel to the Nogri homeworld of Honegar to negotiate, at least an end of the kidnappings, if not to the support of the Nogri. Leia ends up succeeding well beyond her wildest dreams. So, we've got a lot of world building here, some of which is brought over from the RPG, some which is new to the books. The first is Coruscant itself, a fully developed city world much like Trantor from Isaac Asimov's Foundation series. The idea of the Imperial capital being a city planet was conceived in early drafts of Return of the Jedi, when Lucas originally intended to have Vader take Luke from Endor to Coruscant, and Ralph McQuarrie had done some concept art for those sequences. However, to my knowledge, Zahn didn't have access to those drafts, nor that concept art. So, while he might have been informed of some basic information, he was on his own here, including with the name, and his descriptions end up shaping descriptions of the planet to come. We also have the introduction of the Imperial Remnant, and a description of the fate of the Republic military after Endor, splintering into a variety of warlords fighting both with the New Republic and among themselves, for resources and territory. We also, of course, have the introduction of the Imperial Grand Admirals through Thrawn, and though, while well, they aren't mentioned by name, we have our introduction to the Chiss. We get some information on how cloning works in the Star Wars universe, and some information about how the Clone Wars turns out, information that would later be retconned by the prequels. In this version, the Clone Wars were between the Clone Masters and their army of clone soldiers, versus the Old Republic, led by the Jedi. We learn that clones can resonate with each other in the Force, and 
clones of the same being working too closely together can literally drive each other mad. Using the Islamari during the cloning process to cut off the clone's connection to the, cor to the Force or weaken it can mitigate this. We get more information on the early days of the Rebel Alliance, that Garm Bel Iblis, Bail Organa, and Mon Mothma brought together a group of dissenting senators and resistance groups all under one banner. This would be somewhat retconned. In a deleted scene in Revenge of the Sith, we see a group of senators that includes Bail Organa, Mon, uh, Mon Mothma, and Padme Amidala pledging to suppose em Emperor Palpatine. And as of Rogue One and Star Wars Rebels, this alliance has brought military groups into their ranks. We get our first trip to Kashyyyk, outside of the Marvel Star Wars series. Nothing here particularly contradicts what we experience in the comics, aside from Leia having never been to Kashyyyk before. We learn that the planet's surface is incredibly inhospitable, which is why everyone lives up in trees, and we learn that while Wookiees are arboreal, they have incredibly strong social prohibitions against fighting with their claws. We learn a lot about the Nogri and their culture. Their culture is based around clans and familial honor, and that Nogri society is also matriarchal. We learn that the environment of the planet was damaged during a space battle during the Clone Wars, and we learn that Darth Vader, and he was Vader at the time, not Anakin Skywalker, pledged to clean their world in return for the service of the Nogri. However, Palpatine undermined the ecological repair process in, keep, in order to keep the Nogri in a state of perpetual slavery. It's not clear if Vader knew about this. Speaking of the Clone Wars, the book sets up that the Clone Wars started 44 years prior to the start of the films. This would later be retconned to 25 years, or 29-ish. Following the death of the Emperor, we learn that several Imperial battle groups and officers defected the Alliance. Presumably they had, at some point, gone through a are we the baddies moment, but they didn't feel they could safely defect until after the Emperor was dead. We're introduced to the Katana Fleet, a group of warships with automation systems designed to reduce the crew count and slaves circuited together so they could, if necessary, be operated remotely. The fleet was lost when a hive virus drove the crew mad causing the crew to slave the ships together and jump out into the Force knows where. Being of which, high viruses are introduced here, and they are incredibly violent, but have no outward symptoms until they emerge all at once, sounding like something you'd come up with in Pandemic 2 as something you're designing to get Madagascar. We are introduced to the concept of Emperor's Hands, Force-sensitive operatives of the Emperor, usually female, who are sent throughout the galaxy to carry out his will. On the Emperor's death, he sent a command to all his hands, demanding that they kill Luke Skywalker. Presumably, should Palpatine have killed Vader and Luke, he would have selected a new apprentice from among his hands, possibly by making them fight amongst themselves. We are introduced to the Bothans and Bothan politics, and in particular, why their hat enabled them to get the plans of the second Death Star. He learned that the Empire, and the Emperor in particular, had some really nasty dirt on the Bothans kept in the storehouse at Wayland, which cannot be allowed to get out. Also, after Card ends up on the wrong side of a Stormtrooper bargain one time too many in this series, he forms the Smuggler's Alliance to provide information, freight capacity, and privateers to the New Republic government. Its founding members are Card, along with other smugglers Parta, Brask, Elor, Dravis, Mazik, and Samuel Gillespie. Leia is now married to Han Solo and is very pregnant with twins as of the start of this series. In spite of this, she is still carrying out diplomatic missions for Mon Mothma and the Republic, along with getting some basic Jedi training from Luke. In order to stop the attacks by the Nogri, she travels to Honegar to meet with the Nogri to stop the attack, showing a side of Leia that we never saw in the films. Leia the Diplomat. By the end of the trilogy, she's given birth to twins, Jaina and Jason, and has also gotten a pair of Nogri bodyguards, along with Chewbacca protecting her and her children due to the Wookiee life debt. 
Winter is Leia's aide. She has been involved in the Rebel Alliance for much of her life, and has known Leia from the court on Alderaan, and is herself an Alderanian. Winter has an eidetic memory, which made her incredibly valuable for the Alliance, particularly when it comes to scouting raids, which led to her getting the code name of Targeter. However, it also means she remembers every single death she's seen, including the destruction of Alderaan, in vivid detail. She becomes Leia's nanny after the birth of the twins, and she is absolutely unflappable, to the point that she is completely unfazed or unstartled by the appearance of the Nogri, or by their exceptional stealth abilities. Luke is attempting to train Leia in the ways of the Force in her copious free time. He has resigned his commission in the Republic military, but is still willing to help with diplomatic efforts. His experiences with Vader have lead him to try to redeem Jeroyus Sabayoth. However, after Sabayoth reveals that he has gone as far down the path of the dark side as Palpatine has, at that point, Luke is willing to kill him. As mentioned with Leia, Han is married to Leia, and like Luke, has resigned his commission. However, he's currently working with the Republic government, and at the start of the trilogy, is trying to get smugglers to go legit and haul freight for the Republic. Over the course of the series, he repeatedly shows his resistance and reluctance to Leia's attempts to try and go get herself killed, both when she's pregnant and after she's given birth, but he is absolutely willing to do it himself. Chewbacca's life dead is more formally introduced in this trilogy, and extends not only to Han, but also to his family. As with the Han Solo adventures, Chewbacca is an incredibly skilled mechanic, and is able to sabotage the ship of Nogri Commando Kabarak in such a way that Imperial scanning crews are unable to detect the sabotage. Unfortunately, being furry, he also sheds, which leads to Kabarak getting arrested anyway. R2-D2 has not only not received a memory wipe since at least before Leia loaded the Death Star plans into them, into him during the events of the New Hope, but he has also built up a level of counterpart familiarity with Luke's X-Wing that makes him work better with that X-Wing than any other droid. Indeed, maintenance checks cannot be run on Luke's X-Wing without R2. C-3PO can be reprogrammed to have another human's voice, but it's a violation of his programming. Lando Calrissian has not retaken Cloud City, and has instead started a new operation on the planet Niklon, building an ambulatory mining colony that moves across the night side of an otherwise inhospitable planet. This idea was used earlier in science fiction in Kim Stanley Robinson's The Memory of Whiteness from 1985. Thrawn ends up destroying Lando's mining operation, show, leading to both of Lando's major businesses that we've seen thus far having thus been destroyed, disabled, or otherwise taken from him by the forces of the Empire. After the destruction of the Death Star, Palpatine took Vader's other hand, retconning Splinter of the Mind's Eye. Vader was aware of the Emperor's hands, presumably as a way for Palpatine to make it clear that if necessary, Vader could be replaced. As mentioned before, Palpatine sent a telepathic command to the Emperor's hands, ordering them to kill Luke Skywalker just before his death. That is, he sent the command just before his death, not that they should kill Luke Skywalker just before he died. Palpatine had Luke's severed hand and old lightsaber saved from Bespin and stored in the storehouse at Wayland. This novel also sets up that Palpatine had been planning to take control of the Republic for years before he finally took control, back when he was still a senator. Getting into new characters, Nigel Ferrier is a ship thief who was originally drawn into Thrawn's orbit due to his skills in that field, and he tries to stay there by feeding Thrawn information, but his ambition ends up becoming his undoing. As mentioned earlier, Talon Card has become one of the top smuggler chiefs after the death of Jabba the Hutt. Card values information considerably, and values his people as much, if not more so. Actually, definitely more so. Card initially intends to stay out of the conflict between the Imperial Remnant and the New Republic. However, he also considers hospitality sacred, and this ends up leading to him being forced to side with the New Republic when Thrawn takes an interest in some of his previous guests, particularly Luke 
and then also Han and Lando. When this happens, he goes all in, forming the Smuggler's Alliance, and is able to hold the organization together in spite of the machinations of Thrawn and the treachery of Nigel Ferrier. Niles Ferrier. As mentioned earlier, Mara Jade is one of the Emperor's hands, special operatives given special training and clearances, allowing them to go anywhere and everywhere in the Empire to carry out the Emperor's will, up to and including assassinating upstart Imperial officers. This included having back doors installed in Imperial warships that only Imperial hands could access, and hidden weapon caches placed in facilities that only they would know about. Mara also received some training in the Force from the Emperor, including knowledge of how to perform some basic mind tricks, force choking, and general telekinesis. She was sent undercover at Jabba's palace to kill Luke, and when that failed, she returned to Coruscant to wait for her next assignment and was present there when Palpatine died, and she receives her his final command. She had been present for Thawne's promotion to Grand Admiral, both at the public and private ceremonies. The latter is not described. She had been to Wayland with Palpatine once, and so when she learns about the clones, she is able to help guide Luke, Han, and Lando there, as she'd rather the New Republic beat Thrawn over getting a new wave of Clone Wars. Further, her desire to kill Luke is due to the Emperor's conditioning, so when Jeruus Sabaoth makes a clone of Luke Skywalker from Luke's severed hand, killing the clone is enough to fulfill the Emperor's last command. After this, she feels more amiable towards Luke, though not romantic yet. Grand Admiral Thrawn has been working for Darth Sidious, though that name is not used, since back when he was Senator Palpatine. He destroyed the Outband Flight Project, and killed the original Joris, Joris Sabaoth in the process, as per Palpatine's orders. Thrawn uses art to judge his opponents, both in terms of the psychology of the species based on how their art is structured, and specific opponents, in particular through what art they collect. He also values natural art such as coral reefs as well. Thrawn is ultimately killed by his no-creep bodyguard, Rook, and Thrawn fails to kill Niles Ferrier and Jeruus Sabaoth after they screw up his plans for the last time. I'll get into this in the final thoughts. Captain Gilead Pelion is Thrawn's number two, the Watson to his homes, something that Zahn makes clear as deliberate in the annotated version of Heir to the Empire. However, unlike the Nigel Bruce version of Watson, Pelion is by no means stupid. He is just as just competent in different directions from Thrawn. Pelion had served in the Old Republic Navy during the Clone Wars, all the way through the Empire to the present. After Thrawn's demise at the end of the series, Pelion becomes leader of the Imperial Remnant. This is the first source that sets up that Luke's lightsaber and Anakin's last before it became Vader, were able to be recovered from Bespin. This concept would be reused in The Force Awakens. With this book, we really get into the concept of the New Republic having this constantly simmering turmoil just below the surface for much of its life. How this ultimately manifests varies by the writer. In this book, the blame is laid, effectively, at the feet of Borsk Philia. In particular, it's made clear that Phalia is making the assumption that everyone else in the galaxy does politics exactly the way the Bothans do, which is a poor assumption for your planetary representative on a multiracial, multicultural governing body like their public council to make. For that matter, it would be a bad assumption for the planetary representative on the Old Republic Senate to make. We'll see how the series goes on, how other writers handle this. This is a great way to restart the Star Wars Expanded Universe. Zahn absolutely has the voice for the original series characters, and the new characters he brings to the table tonally fit with the universe perfectly. Not all writers will have this in the years to come. Additionally, while Thrawn has gotten something of a bad rap as an unstoppable mastermind who can only be beaten through Deus Ex Machina, that's simply not true. 
Ron has a blind spot for figures who don't follow or fit within the chain of command. He knows the chain of command of the New Republic, he knows Bothan psychology, so he can use that to keep the Republic Council fighting amongst its own members while he scoops up a few systems here and there. However, wild cards, no pun intended, like Talon Card, Mara Jade, Niles Ferrier, and Jeruas Sabayoth are just too chaotic to fit neatly into his plans. The perfect example of this is Ferrier. Ferrier is a skilled ship thief, and he's good enough at it to build up a crew to help with his efforts and let him hit, har hit larger targets. He does smuggle on the side in between jobs, but that's not his field. But once he gets into anything more ambitious than ripping off some ships, he starts stumbling. The reason he has any sort of organization at all is because he knows what he's good at, and he's just unambitious enough to keep things at a size that he can handle without having to delegate too much, and he's lucky enough to stumble into people that he can hire to cover his shortcomings. Ron, on the other hand, is a brilliant tactician and strategist. He can put together plans that involve fleets of ships and multiple systems, crewed by people who know their jobs and capabilities and who have the discipline to follow orders. TV Tropes compares him to Napoleon, and it's a valid comparison. What Thrawn isn't is a spymaster. Thrawn assumes that Farrier must have his uses, or he couldn't have built up an organization like the one he has. When no, Farrier is good at a small selection of things, and outside of the things he's good at, he is a complete idiot. What's needed to run someone like Farrier, or for that matter, Card, is someone like, to use an example from another fictional series, George Smiley. Someone who can recognize Farrier's strengths and weaknesses, and who can keep him away from the parts of the operation that he can screw up, and should he become a liability, is willing to have him quietly and discreetly disposed of should that time come. However, Thrawn is no Smiley, and frankly, the last head of Imperial Intelligence that we encounter, Asan Isar from the X-Wing series, which we'll be getting to later, is also no Smiley. In terms of the rest of the writing, the story is structured incredibly well, with the story structure fitting within the narrative of the films almost perfectly, in terms of how the films are structured. The later books in the series, in particular The Last Command, play a little more with shifting perspectives and timelines going to one point-of-view character, bouncing back in the timeline a bit when shifting to another point-of-view character, and then moving to catch up with where we were in the story last time. Tolkien sort of does this in the Lord of the Rings series, except to a much more dramatic degree, where you'll have a big swatch of time with Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli, and we'll rewind that back and do a whole bunch of time with, well, the hobbits in the Forest of Fangorn, and so on. Next time, we return to comic books with Dark Horse Comics' first outing in the Star Wars universe, Dark Empire 1. See you then. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like this video and subscribe to the channel to be notified when new videos come out. If there's something in particular you'd like to see me cover or just want to get your name in the credits or otherwise help the show, please support my Patreon. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.